What a treat to be with my dear friend, Kelly Belkamp. Kelly, we were talking when I first did episode one, and I've been bugging you for about 106 episodes. And finally, <laughs> finally, we can talk. <laughs> I'm so here excited. we are. Here we are. I'm so happy to be here. So, Kelly, one of the things I love about you is your your business is in, before you had your company now, you are a massage therapist, you are a personal trainer, you know everything about health. And of course, there's good trainers, there's bad trainers, but you're always one that you gave me so much good advice on rehab and everything about the body and health related. And I never forget, we had a chat about finance and you know all this stuff about finance. And I was like, man, you, you are really well-rounded. Have you always just been a curious person or how did you learn all that stuff about finance? Because it's, it's, it was nothing to do with your field and you have a really deep knowledge for someone who's not in finance. I appreciate you saying that. I, I think uh, jack of all trades, master of none is, is the term <laughs> used. I really, I am. I'm curious about things and I try to look into things. Also, if it has anything to do with my world or making my world a little bit better. I try to dive into it a little bit, but it, it is pretty as, as much attention as I can give to other things in my profession. It's not deep, but it is broad. Maybe I try to try to get that information. So, but thanks for and, saying that. <laughs> but we, would, we would have these chats, Kelly. And I, I, I'm always so impressed by people that like, I remember you were really frustrated with the stuff that was going on on the, on the left when Trump was president, but you're also, you didn't like Trump as a person. So like, I like people like you where you're not one side or the other, you're expressing grievances on both sides. So you're not just team mentality. You're frustrated about the things you should be frustrated about. And that's one of the, one of the things that we would talk about that I was so, it was so refreshing to me because it was just when we were kind of in the middle of COVID and everyone was going crazy. And now history has shown that there was a lot of, a lot of shade in us and a lot of people overreacted and there was a lot of people that went down the rabbit hole and barely came back with mental health and it was almost like the whole society didn't care about any of that stuff and i remember you and i were talking in the early days like like what about if you're a young mom and if you're a nurse and they're like okay kids can stay at home you can teach the kids and you've got to go to your job like all these things that these policymakers didn't seem to think about and th there was just no foresight i remember you and i were talking in the early days and we it's nice to be proven right, not to gloat, but we were right about right. all this stuff from the beginning. Where, where we could be calm and have discussions about things. And that, I think, was the biggest thing at that time was for both of us, we just thought, can we just all take a moment, take a step back and look at mm. what's happening? And yes. no one was able to do, no, most people were unable to do that because of the way they approached, they wanted to tell, they wanted everyone to be fearful, that they mm. could have a little bit more control over the situation when everyone was fearful. So unfortunately... For for most people, that was the case, but I don't know if I was just being obstinate or what. But I was like, I, I just give me a minute. Let me let me take this all in and make some decisions for myself. That's how it seemed like you were feeling as well. But Kelly, that I really think that comes down to the fact of being a bit well rounded is when you know things about different areas, and then you hear something, you have that instinct to where it just this doesn't seem right, or it seems like there's some things that they're overlooking. But even just the last year, I feel like. I'm really trying to listen to trusting my gut because your gut instinct is everything you've ever seen, heard, read, thought about, and it's all in your subconscious. So when you hear something, you just have that feeling like this just sounds like bullshit or, or like, yeah, this, this sounds pretty accurate. And it's, it's so hard to do to, to listen to that feeling, but it's, I had someone once say to me, has your gut ever been wrong? And I thought about it and I was like, I don't think so. And uh, we were just talking off air. Like, you know, that debacle I went through with that contractor that screwed me over. And luckily that's all behind me. But I had a feeling looking back when I first met him, I was like, man, he seems right on paper. You know, he's been doing development for 20 years. Everything seemed right. But I did have this feeling where I just didn't, there was something about him that was a little off. And I remember thinking like, oh, you're just being silly or paranoid. That's a perfect example of just that, yeah. that feeling. Talk to yourself out of it. Absolutely. The, that's the thing. It's like how many times in your life or anyone's life do you say, I knew it. I knew it. Mm. And like, you just didn't listen for whatever reasons, because society said you should just do what was, was this, this correct yes. path or because you second guessed yourself because you're, oh, I'm being, I'm being silly or I'm being stupid or I'm being whatever. Like, don't, don't listen to what you're saying. 44 years old now, I feel like I can listen to it a little bit better, but certainly mm. when I was younger, I don't know that I would trust it as much as I should have. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kelly, Kelly you, you and I are both, you know, we've been very athletic, our whole lives pushing our body. And there is a part of me, of, of course, I'm a little sad. You're getting older, you're slowing down, your joints hurt more. But one thing, like with the same age, we're 44, it's so nice having that feeling. Like I feel the same way. For the first time, I can actually just be happy without wanting something to be happy. I can just decide to be happy and I can just decide to trust myself. And it's, it's a really nice feeling. So 
<laughs> with age <laughs> wisdom, right? With age. Exactly. But Kel, let's, that, I do want to talk to you about everything health related because you're such an expert. But before we do, I really, I'd love to start with your qualifying for Boston because I know I kind of, I was, I was, I was seeing you go through how hard it was. And, um, our mutual friend, Brad, is he's trying to qualify for the second time in a few weeks. So I've been seeing him go through the process. And if you're not a natural runner, like you, you do a lot of strength training. I wouldn't say you're a natural runner. Like some people, yeah. I'm not yeah. a natural runner. He's not a natural mm-hmm. runner. So it's just, it was so cool that you had that goal and it took you, you know, it took you a few times till you got <laughs> it, but, but, but then, but then you kept with it. And I remember a couple uh-huh. of times, like you, you were doing, you were doing everything right. You'd have this perfect training, your numbers were good. And then you would do a race and it would just be unseasonably hot or something like that. And of course Correct. that kills your times. So Correct. can we talk, reminisce a little bit? For sure. Qualifying? For sure. Love it. Love it. Anything marathon, certainly my life has changed. I, I qualified for, or I ran Boston in 2015. So we're talking a while ago now at this point, a while. but time has, has definitely shifted. But the process of getting there was, is kind of a little bit funny because it was years before that, that I was working out of the gym one day. I was absolutely bored out of my mind. I was like, what am I doing? Like, what's, what's I, yes, I want to exercise. I've always exercised. I want to exercise to be healthy. But at that moment, I was like, this is getting old. That's what I thought to be something. There's got to be something else to move for. And I'd never been a runner and I decided, I'm going to try to set up. I'm going to try to do a half marathon. And so a friend of mine and I decided, let's do this. When my friend got hurt, she couldn't run it. And so I ran it by myself. And it was in San Francisco where I lived at the time. And I ran, it in like two, I want to say it was like two hours and 15 minutes. It was something, it was, I finished, it was fine. But I promptly went home and slept like two hours and 15 minutes. I was exhausted. I was in no way well trained for it. But yet I got the same, this like little bit of an itch for it, even though I I kind of hated it a little bit, but liked it a lot. There there were like two sides of the coin, but I thought, okay, now I got to do a marathon. I got to check that out unless I've done a half. So let's try a full. And over the course of about, I want to say six months or seven months, it was not a very long time, but I, I started training and I did my first marathon in Sacramento, California. And that was okay. It was like four hours and I think, I don't remember. So it's just over four hours and it was so hard, but it also like kind of said, Hey, I think I really might like this. Maybe I'm going to do another one. I don't know. I did one. Maybe I won't do another. And then another friend of mine and I decided we would run Chicago and we did that, actually did that together. And that was such a fun experience. But she at the time was living in San Francisco and I had moved to Chicago. So she met me. And that morning before we decided to run, she goes, I have an idea. And I said, so do I. And I said, well, what's your idea? She was, I'm going to do an ultra marathon one day. And I was like, I am not doing that, but I am going to qualify for Boston. And I said that in 2009, it was like the first thought that I had, like that really came to fruition in my head. And then I knew it was going to be a very long journey because the times are so fast. And as a yeah. non-running a or non-runner, like it, it's just not my my genetics to be a runner. Mm. So well, from, yeah, it just, yeah. From I was going to say, Anyone that's just listening to this, I always joke when I see you, you look like Linda, ha- Linda Hamilton in, in Terminator 2. Like you've always got real nice shoulders <laughs> and biceps. Like you, you look real athletic. You look like a like a personal trainer. That's kind of your look, right? So yeah. most runners are kind of, they look weak and skinny and they're just, the they, really good runners are just these weights. They look skinny and fast, right? Fly through, exactly. Fly through the air. So, <laughs> so yeah, so just, just I just sort of yeah. put that out there. But uh, yeah. that's, so the first time, so then the, the next marathon after you made it, so after Chicago, were you trying to qualify? No, oh, you I, was, I was not. Experience. I was trying to start to push my time down because I was tr- I was being reasonable about it. But yet I did run like two or three marathons a year then over the course of the next few years. I just kept I just wow. kept trying. It was like a constant training with with recovery, but, mm-hmm. you know, thoughtful, thoughtful training and thoughtful recovery. If Looking back, I would tell you I probably didn't do it all quite right. Um, right. But there's things that I would have changed. and I probably could have been better faster. You know what I'm right. saying? But over the course of the year, I, I then decided, hey, if I'm going to do this many, I know it's going to take me some time. Let's go visit different cities mm-hmm. and and try these. Why not? You know? And so I went from, I did Austin, Texas. I did San Diego, uh, Anchorage, Alaska, a little place up Charlevoix, Michigan, which, you know, like I went to uh, Washington, D.C. Like I just kind of went over Pittsburgh. Um, and then I finally got to 2000. It must have been 2014. I went and ran in uh, Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio, and it's a relatively flat course, but also it was in May and I had this feeling like, okay, 
I've been doing all these October races and they end up being 90 degrees or 80 degrees and it's awful for running. And I, I couldn't have been more perfect. It was 46 degrees to start, 60 degrees to finish. And I had a time, I, I finished three hours and 33 minutes and like 35 seconds. It was like, and I had just turned 35, like three days before. So I got an extra five minutes. Oh, That's how I qualified. Because I qualified the time for 34 year old. But because so many other people with the, mm. that's the process with Boston, you can qualify with the time. But if other people, if too many other people have gone faster than you in your age and, and gender, you won't get in, even if you've got the qualifying time, if that makes sense. Yeah, we'll play, that's also frustrating so because there's so yeah. many people that so, want to go now. You have to be more, you have to be better than the qualifying times. It makes you it have to be better harder. By, by like, and I was better by the 30, 34 year old by like a minute and 30 seconds or something along those lines. And that wouldn't, I would never have made it. So the only reason I made it was because I turned 35. So I'll accept it. Age, age gave me an opportunity. So that was cool. And then, then to be fair, Boston was amazing. It was, it was a very, very ex amazing experience, but I still have such a fond uh, place in my heart for Cleveland because mm, I qualified. So cool. it just felt yeah. there was such a moment of like, wow, I did it. <laughs> I think, I think that that's such it. a good, Kelly, it's such a good metaphor for life. The feeling you got, that accomplishment after many years, many marathons, it had to be so much greater than if you were just very talented and you ran, ran your second marathon. You're like, man, I qualified. That's so cool. But I didn't know it. Just, I didn't even know I qualified. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just, it, it's just such a good metaphor for life that so many times we seek the easy things and it's really that the, the wisdom and the, and the joy of life so many times is, is by hard things. And that's one thing I, I really mentally, the biggest thing on my mind, like we were talking about that, that, um, the whole debacle with that contractor because it wasn't just my money it was like our friends and family invested it was just this whole negative thing it was really weighing on me and what really helped and and this applies to anything in your life that that's that, that's not going well i thought about now i'm a dad with, with my my little cub i thought man if i never had any struggles how am i supposed to give him any wisdom like when he's older and he's he's going through struggle how am i supposed to even you know empathize or like give them advice or if, if, if my life was just easy. And so I really love that. I think it's like a biblical phrase. Don't wish for an easy life, wish for the strength to endure a hard one. I think there's so much wisdom to that because it's just human nature to always look for the easy, easy life. But back in the day when we were hunter gatherers, that was still a hard life. Whereas now society has made life so easy. If you just follow the easy path, it's, it's not going to be a happy life. It's going to be a very miserable life. And it's certainly not going to be, there's not going to be any physical, challenges at this yes. point in life we don't have to, there's nothing difficult physically that we're made to do in order to live our lives at this point now unless you have a physical job which that's exactly, true but yeah. like most people don't have that and so to create it in your world somehow i think is super important to to be a little bit resistant to stress in that way like oh i've i can handle this whatever this is because i've already been through something else mm. Okay, just just a quick trip down memory lane. Your your marathon in Charlevoix, Michigan. So yes, our, our mutual friend Brad, he was doing the half marathon, and mm -hmm. he was uh, married at the time, but they were kind of going through some some troubles before they got divorced. So he called me a couple of days before, and he was like, "Hey, I'm doing this half marathon. Was I'm having a weekend in northern northern Michigan, but you know, I'm fighting my wife, and uh, do you want to come?" And I was like, "Sure." So so I I didn't have her number or anything. Of course I was you said yes. <laughs> Of course so, you said yes. So oh, I didn't have, half marathon? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so so we're, we're running, and I didn't know, I had no idea that you and your, your husband, Brian, you were there. So I'm running, and I see this guy, and he's just kind of smiling at me. And I'm like, he just kind of feel it, but I'm not even thinking it's my buddy, Brian. And then he's like, hey, buddy, and he gives me a hug. And I remember just being so surprised, and it was so awesome that, that was, you were there during the run. Then we had lunch after. So it's just, it's so funny. Chicago is such a small, big city. It's wild. Yeah. You, do a, you yep. do a race five hours north of Chicago, and you see your, your buddy on the, on the course. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Super random. Super great. That was fun. Oh, I love yeah, it. It's so awesome. But, it, but um, it's not, it's, I guess it's not surprising to me. The world, the, especially people that are, active there's a lot of mm. folks that are you'll see a lot in all of these situations but it was always fun for me to see you because you change i mean i mean speaking of someone who's not like necessarily a runner but you can go out and you can do things because you want to try them that most people would never do in accordance with running again you are a fighter your background is that but you can you you add everything in your life to have i think just like a mixture of everything but I mean, you went out and ran 35 miles on your 35th birthday. Like that one sticks with me always. I'm like, God 
goodness. So, so I don't know. Cheers to you for that. Oh, <laughs> for you. being feel, open feel like- to trying new things. And at a, at a, a drop of a hat, when a friend calls you and says, I want to run a half marathon, you're like, I'm in. <laughs> I like that. But uh, Kelly, I think I'm really lucky to have friends, though, that say that to me. They call me and they're like, hey, you want to do this? Because I'm, I'm lucky that yeah. I have people that push me. But, but the something about running is so like, I've done triathlons and I just, I realized that I swimming was actually my sport in high school. It's my, probably my biggest sport, but there's something about uh, you have to go to a pool and, or, or you have to get a bike and transport it. I just, I don't, I just love running. It's so easy. You can travel. I know in the world, you have a pair of running shorts and you just off you go. And um, I yeah. think for me, a lot of people have asked like, oh, do you meditate? And I, I'm trying to do a little bit of just a little bit, but I, I barely do. But running is meditation for me. It's like you go out, it's just you and your thoughts. Sometimes I don't bring music. I don't have a, I don't have any watch or anything. I'm not looking at my pace. You just, yeah. you're just running. It's something so, it's so good for your mind. I think so from an evolutionary perspective, what is more ingrained in our DNA than running? I just can't think of anything. No, I think you're right. And I think that's what's, what's so good about having the opportunity, opportunity to do it. And also what can be so frustrating for many people when it comes to running and how difficult it is. I mean, running is really hard yeah. and like, it's just a challenging activity. And because mm-hmm. we we're not forced to do it after we're, well, kids aren't forced. Kids do it because it's fun. Yeah. But once we get to a certain age, it no longer is fun. It's, it's exercise and it's boring. And it's like, oh, I have to go do this. And I got to tell you from the perspective of now, um, someone who's accomplished something like, that I was very proud of in my career running qualifying for Boston pre pre um, having babies and now being have had having had three three kiddos and like you can't control what your body does yeah I can control mm-hmm. being strong and I can t- continue to be strong but I will still tell you at this moment running mm-hmm. is not the same as it was before kids will it be mm-hmm. again I believe it will and I believe it will because I'll. I'll put focus and energy towards it, but it's going to be much more focus and energy than it used to be. Mm. Yeah. So like when I, I can't do all of the recovery things that I need to do. And so going out there and running three to four miles feels it's hilarious because it feels there's my workout. I finish and I'm like, okay, and now I'm going to go do some kettlebells or something like that. And then I'm like, Oh, I'm done. And before that would have been my warm up. Three to four miles would have been a warm up, and then I would have just done the actual run, and then you know whatever. And that's I, I think back to that, and I, I have uh, high hopes for the future to get back to that. I I I think maybe when my kids, I don't know, when my little guy who's one, almost one and a half, when he's like probably three or four, I'll probably have a little bit more balance there. I think. Well, Kel, that's one thing. I'm really so much more open now to just knowing that I'm going to change my mindset on certain things. And one of the big things that I didn't realize is as as a man, until you live through, live with someone going through pregnancy and just seeing the effects on a woman's body, you you know, intellectually, yeah, women have kids and, you know, my mom had me, but you don't really appreciate it. Like I have so much more appreciation. And then you just every, every time you have one of your boys, you know, you, you bounce back so quickly. You were straight in the gym. You, you were so healthy with it. Um, it that's, I have so much more respect for you having lived through someone else doing that too with, with Jen. And, um, it really is, it's something that we're so lucky. We don't have to deal with all the changes that, that you do with, with, with pregnancy. It's just, it's wild. Yeah. So for a female Except for athlete, most, most, except for most guys, they gain like, you know, 20 to 30 pounds when their wives are pregnant. That's just one of those things. I don't, I, I would like to like give them a break and say it's because they're like, you know, trying to like fit in with what's happening, but it's really, they should really watch that. Or, or Kelly, let me tell you something. During, just so when the world shut down in, what was it? March, April time, 2020, I was very yeah. depressed. I had, I had all these things, you know, my, my birthday was April. I was supposed to do a marathon in Santiago, Chile. Yes. I had all these great goals. Yes. My, my business obviously died. No one's buying houses. No one's leaving the house. I'm like, I was so depressed. And, um, and then Jen got pregnant, which was such a gift. But her friends bought her the most outrageous amounts of like sugary treats because they thought she'd have cravings. She didn't have, she doesn't really have a sweet tooth and she had no right. cravings for sweet things. So she would but just choose did. cravings for salads. So I found <laughs> this stash and I just every night should go to sleep and I would just, just destroy an uh, ungodly amount. You know, and I was still, I worked out every day, but it wasn't really the same intensity. And I, you know, gyms were closed. So I would just do some press yeah, ups, go for a run. on the lake front. Well, that and I'll, yeah. Kelly, I never forget. I never forget being on the sofa and looking down and be like, "Man, I've got a little yeah. gut. This this is embarrassing." I was like, "I got to." I, I went through. You're like, so good thing much. we're locked yeah. down and no one can see me." 
<laughs> so, so I wasn't immune. All, all that stuff, like the COVID weight and all that stuff. I was right there, you know, sympathy weight. I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I, I lost it. But God, that was depressing. And there's something when you get older, it's much harder. Like pe- people that I've got friends when they were young, they would get a little out of shape and then they have a vacation in Mexico and they'll do this crash diet and get in great shape. It's, it's much like easier weeks, when you're young. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As, I remember shifting that weight. That was, that was hard. That was not easy. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. It's not easy. It's and that's what I would say is like for on for the woman side of things, that's why you never stop exercising and being thoughtful. Yes. So what's going in? I mean, if you have cravings and such, like there's there is some sort of um underlying physiological like again, like thing that's saying you you need this. Like, okay, yes, you need salt, powers. you need whatever. Yep. And I'm not gonna argue with it. I don't think fruit loops are the best thing, but like if that's what you really, really want and you're pregnant, like, eh, okay, you can have a little bit. But just make sure you remember you're not eating for two. You're eating for one, building a human mm-hmm. being inside of you and be thoughtful about the, the the amount and try to be as healthy as you can. But if you can keep exercising in your normal way throughout, it makes just birth in general and mm-hmm. then bouncing back from it that much easier. I would also say. And this may be, I don't know if it's controversial or not, but like if you are pregnant or wanting to get pregnant, I would suggest starting a routine of exercise. I'm not saying go out and do the the most high intensity exercise you can find. I would actually suggest against that. I would find something that makes sense, but you've got to start moving your body. You've got to get stronger. You've got to set up a good environment for that, for that child. And the only way you're going to do that is by having a healthy body. And I think it's so frustrating to me when I've heard doctors that I go to when I'm pregnant say, oh, sure, you can keep exercising, but don't do deadlifts. And I'm like, well, why not? (laughs) Why? And they're just not good. No, don't do those. I'm like, you, you, I am not a doctor, not going to ever pretend I am, but this doctor who is there to tell me how to like go through my pregnancy, which by the way, is now a disease. I don't know if you've noticed that, but we look at pregnancy as like an illness. Hmm. It's the craziest thing. We're like, okay, here's all the things you need to do now that you have this illness, okay? (laughs) Don't eat this. Don't do this. Do this. Mm. Do this. All these things, all this list of things. It's like, okay, hold on a second. Like, this is a natural process that has been happening for however long we've been around. Mm. Can we let the body do kind of what it needs to do? And then maybe give some input on like, what are some good things to do? And again, movement is one of those things. Again, aside from the high risk situation where any little thing could cause a major problem. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the general person getting the general woman getting pregnant and wanting to do the best for herself and her, her almost, you know, new child. So it's just, it's an upsetting thing that I've seen with our, our healthcare system. And I wish that especially OBs and people that speak with pregnant women would be a little bit more engaged in creating the healthy atmosphere for them. What does that mean? Exercise wise? What does that mean? Food wise? You know, it, it's just not, it's missing. It's missing. I'm so glad you said that because you, you, you turned me on to the, it was a Peter Atiyah podcast that I love, The Drive. And yeah. one, one, so before, even fairly recently, I always thought in terms of health for longevity, I always thought, well, the heart is the most important thing. So cardio is the most important thing. And for me, strength training was either to help with my martial arts or it was just to look good with my shirt off. I never really thought about it for health. And he's so big on the fact that if, if you have that, the idea of the Centurion Olympics, so when I'm 100 or when I'm very old, I want to have the ability to walk up a flight of stairs or not fall over and, and carry a bag of groceries, that you have to backdate it and say, okay, now when I'm in my whatever, 40s or 50s, I'm going to have consistent strength training because as you get older, you just keep losing muscle mass. Okay. And th- so he really, he said the same thing about the importance of strength training. And I feel like that's something very few doctors talk about. And even just the fact that, isn't there something like, the amount of um, nutrition uh, classes doctors take is so minimal. And there's something like, you know, there's some statistic where 18 months after you graduate medical school, 40% of what you've learned is already obsolete. You know, things are moving so quickly. And, um, and you know, of course, there's some incredible doctors like Dr. Peter Atiyah, but uh, oh, so many doctors are just, it's almost like, I don't want to take, if I have an out of shape personal trainer, and I'm a big believer in personal freedom. So I'm a big believer in if you want to be healthy or if you want to be unhealthy, like kind of do you. But at the same time, if I'm trying to get in good shape, I want my trainer to look somewhat inspirational. And it's the same thing with doctors. Most doctors um, don't look like the kind of people that, you know, like let's, RFK Jr. 
he looks like the kind of guy I want to, I don't know how old he is, he's in his 60s, thick. but thick, 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 yeah. he's, he's strong, jacked, healthy looking. I'm like, that's a guy, I probably want to listen to him because whatever he's doing is, is kind of what I want to do. You know? So I think yeah. this, I know that's very superficial, but there's some truth to that. Um, and, and, and Docs is a good example. But Kelly, like, so your, your knowledge of health is, is so incredible. I remember we were talking and I was asking you about the vaccine because I thought, I think at the time this was, the evidence was out pretty early um, that if you're young and young and healthy, COVID is not a huge risk thing. So I didn't want to take the vaccine because I was like, well, there's no long-term studies and I don't really think I need it. But I, I did want to go to Europe and see my family. And I was like, well, you know, they're requiring these these vaccine mandates and, and I've got to go if I want to travel. So I was like, oh, I kind of want to, you know, Jen and I wanted to go to Europe and we should get the vaccine. But I, I, I remember the only person that I trusted to ask was you. And you said, listen, you said, the, the risk for someone like you who's healthy is, is so minimal. I don't think it's an issue. And, and I'm really, so, so I guess the, the reason I'm saying this is because of all the people that I know, the one person that I trusted most with this was you, because I remember us talking and we would talk about other vaccine studies and you'd say, oh yeah, but that study was, you, you, you knew the study, like I would hear it maybe on a podcast, someone would talk about a study and you'll say, yeah, but that study wasn't accurate because of this. And you, you were incredibly well-versed back then. And I'm sure you're more well-versed now in, in everything vaccine related. <laughs> um, but the, I feel like now, so, so I, um, I hope if they're listening to this, I hope I don't offend, offend them, but some of Jen's friends um, back then, they were very just in general kind of, they were kind of against vaccines. And I remember thinking back then, talking about changing mindsets, I'm very much a scientific guy and I'm like, well, vaccines, you know, cured all these horrible diseases. And I was like, they're kind of a little bit crazy with the anti-vax stuff. Now, more recently, I did a podcast with this Dr. Tess Laurie and she mm -hmm. said, got something like 5,000 peer reviewed studies. And she said, she said she, all her three kids were vaccinated. And she said, if I had to do it again, I wouldn't vaccinate them. And I'm just like, man, that's so, and then, and then the more, the more research you do, um, like the, the, the study where they say, if you look in the 1970s, that the kids would get say 10 or 12 vaccines and autism was one in 10,000. And now you're getting, you know, 80, 80 or 85 or something crazy. And now it's mm -hmm. one in 40 or something. So that, that there's, there's so much, and it's not exactly linked because how are you supposed to account for variables? No, you can't. Yeah. But it just, it's terrifying as a parent because now I'm forced to make a decision where this isn't my field. I have to rely on people I trust. And I'm so aware of, of all the, all the shenanigans, like w which, which, um, company has had the biggest lawsuits, you know, in history. It's Pfizer for lying. And then I, I don't know if you've seen it, but that documentary on uh, P pain Inc. Yeah. Is, is so everyone should watch that because it's just, it's, it's on oxycodone, but it's more, it just shows how they think. And these people that we assume are these people that you trust and they have yeah. no regard for like, people's lives. It's all about money. So as soon as you have money involved, you have fuckery involved and then trying to figure out what's going on. It's just such a mess. So I'd love to hear kind of how you've changed your thoughts. And, and cause it's just, yeah. I think it's, I, I'm at that age, Kelly, where a lot of my friends are going to listen to this. We're all in the same boat. You know, we either have young kids that we have to make these decisions for, or we're planning to start a family or plan to have another kid. So these are like the, of all the things that I worry about my career, you know, that I'm, you know, money issues, all, all that stuff. The most important thing by far is the risk of possibly injuring my little cub, you know? So. Absolutely. I, I think that, well, first I'll say this when I first had, had my first son, so he's now six. So as that was occurring, I remember thinking as I was pregnant, like, what do I want to do here? How do I want to handle this? And I, it was, I didn't think much, I didn't think much of like any sort of connection between major illnesses and vaccines. I just thought like, I don't know, just seems like a lot. That, that's how I kind of remember thinking about it. There's something there. I've heard all these people, all these people, some people, you know, these far off, like, crazy conspiracy people talk about there's something bad. But again, I was kind of thinking in my gut, like there's maybe something here. Like, why are there so many more than when I was a kid? Yeah. And so I, I spaced him out a little bit, but you know, didn't notice anything with it that would like indicate that there was any issue. And then baby number two came, we had all sorts, we had a bunch of issues with, this is being a self-employed human being, health insurance issues, which made us the only doctor we could find for our, our kiddo was an hour away from us. It was bananas. So basically I went from wanting to stretch out the vaccine like schedule with, with the first guy to the, our second little guy. I didn't because I couldn't get to the hospital or to the doctor that often. It was, mm. it was too hard. So I kept him on a regular schedule and then fast forward to 
COVID and fast forward to the, to the COVID vaccine. And I am thinking about possibly getting pregnant. Mm. Not even like, not even like, we're definitely gonna have a third. It was just kind of like, if we do, we do. If, you know, God blesses us with another baby, amazing. If not, then that's that. But I don't know yet. So I'm not gonna, I don't wanna mess with anything. Again, I wanna keep my body as healthy as possible. And the thing that got me the most was that all the information kept coming out. Well, every, every one of my clients at the time would say to me, Kelly, it's safe. It's effective. Mm. Like th- there's no reason not to take this. And I'm like, I appreciate what you're saying and you're hearing something and you're believing it and God bless you that you do. I don't because I'm not allowed to have lunch meat. I'm not allowed to have a glass of wine. I'm not supposed to have caffeine. I'm not supposed to take Tylenol, uh, allergy medicine, you name it. But I'm supposed to put an injection in my arm when I have no idea what it's going to do to me. Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't, I wasn't buying it. And then praise be, I got pregnant not too long after that. And I still, I pushed off that even though everyone told me I still needed to get it. I still said, all my doctors said I needed to get it. But it started to make me really rethink the way we look at things because I went, I did have to go to see a high um, risk doctor at, for this last pregnancy. And I spoke to him and he said, everything looks really good. You know, the only thing I would suggest is that you get the vaccine. And I asked, I said, well, okay. Can you explain why I, I've already had COVID and I explained and while I was pregnant, I had COVID and everything was fine. So I asked like for some information he had, he could, he could list only one study. And in that study they tested, it was, it was, it was a very small study and they did not test anyone like that didn't, it was, it was such a bad representation of any information. There was no information. They didn't even t- do a test on people that didn't get the vaccine. It was, mm-hmm. it was insane. So I'm like, I can't accept that as if that's your only evidence, I can't accept it. And so I walked out of that meeting and I never had like that uh, a visit. I never, I actually did see him, I think one more time maybe, but I didn't follow any, any advice from that, but it made me start to question a lot of things. Even that during my pregnancy with that one, they made, they suggested the, the Tdap vaccine. I think that's one. They they always say flu, Tdap. There's a bunch of things that you as a pregnant woman should get. And I said, can't you, can't we do a test here and like do, like do my titers find out if I have that still, like if I still have antibodies in my system, because if I do, then there's really no reason to do that. And the nurse was like, yeah, that would make sense. We just don't, we don't have the money or the time to do that. And I'm like, well, that seems silly. So it just opened up my eyes to, Hey, like, let's, let me look into this a little bit more. And so my last little guy here, who's 15 months old now, he was born about a month early and right away, they want to give you a vaccine H um, happy. They want to give it to you the moment that they're born. And I said, Nope, he is one month early. He's, he ended up being in the NICU for about five days. Everything was totally fine. He was just early, but I was like, absolutely not. Don't put anything else into his, his system. And it kind of started me down the path of let's look into this a, a lot more. So at this point, he's gotten a couple of vaccines, but it's really been stretched out. Um, and my main goal here, because some of the research does show that a lot of these things like, reg- and again, there's not a direct connection. There's not. Yeah. I can't say that, you know, you get these vaccines and you get autism. Who knows? But there is something that they call regressive autism, which is what hap- what you'll see present when a kid is has to hit all their mile markers up until like age, like again, 15, 18 months, almost two years where they're starting to talk. And then, you're, and then all of a sudden they, they lose all eye contact. They stop talking all of those things, which is absolutely petrifying to me. And maybe this is just a normal, like illness process or disease process. And it just happens. Maybe regressive autism is just something that's always been around. We just never recognized it. Don't know. But at this point, any of the vaccines that I do choose to give the little guy, and I've actually changed a little bit with the bigger guys, is definitely waiting until they're three years old, mm. because then we're, we've gotten past this. The, the, the body's a little bit more robust. I believe it can handle a little bit more. Looking back, I don't. I I, I think I have really just strong kids. I think that there's a difference. I think everybody will handle assaults differently, yep. and I don't. You can't look at it any other way. But when kids are getting like in their whole life right now, it's like 72 vaccines. Like that's just, when we were growing up, it was, I think it was like 10 or eight or something. Yeah. And so the last time I went to the doctor, I did ask, I'm I'm just asking questions now. I asked my doctor who's been okay with me spreading out, you know, with the little guy for now. And then it was time for my four-year-old to get like chicken pox and like three other ones. 
And so I said, Hey, like, talk me through this. Help me understand why I should be getting this. And it was interesting how quickly the conversation kind of went off the rails. Whereas where she wasn't answering questions and she, then she started using fear and listen, like I had chicken pox, my sisters and I had them all, I think at the same time. I was, I was so sick. I was sick for two weeks. I was covered head to toe in the blisters. It was awful. My mom had to carry me around. My sister had three chicken pox, like three, three blisters. And that was it. Like that was it. And the other one didn't have, and the little guy, little sister didn't have much at all. So it was like, we had the kind of a, a wide array of differences and it was awful. And I would never wish that on my kid. I, I wouldn't want him to have to deal with that. It was horrible from what I remember. But his doctor said, well, when I was in residency, I went in, I, I got to go in and, you know, in with some patients and I walked in there and the, the father said to me, you can only communicate with my son through touch because when he had chicken pox, he became blind and deaf. And I was like, I, that is awful and a horrible story. And I'm so very sorry that that child, that that happened from chicken pox. That is un- unbelievable. And it, it should never have happened, but that's not what we're talking about here. Like the reality of the situation and how serious certain illnesses are for certain people and certain things are like someone down the street just died in a terrible car accident. We should never drive again. That was kind of what it felt like to me. And I was like, this yeah, is it. You're not, you're not answering my question. You're not helping me through this because I am open and I'm willing to hear your information. But when a lot of this, a lot of the studies out there on not, and I'm not talking about chickenpox in particular, cause I really haven't investigated it that much, that one. And some of the other ones you're like, it, those they're not clear. They're not showing clear benefit. And if they are showing benefit, there's not enough long-term information to show why, or they haven't done it or they have it and they're not sharing it. I'm not sure which all of it is. There's, there's mm-hmm. too many levels to it. And I don't want to be so con- conspiratorial or like maybe non-trusting, but again, COVID situation, just like maybe, maybe ask more questions. Mikhail, like I think three years ago to today, the, the idea of this conspiracy, conspiracy theorist being kind of this crazy flat earth, like obviously things that aren't true and all the stuff we've seen that was said to be conspiracy theories, it was proven right. I think if, I mean, if you've got your eyes half open, you have to have a bit more questioning for things. You have to, because we've seen, I just think one good thing about the last few years is we've seen so much shenanigans and there's so much more where pe- people talk about like, hey, how is this public servant that makes $250,000 salary got a portfolio of 150 million? Obviously it's insider trading. And we just see there's so much shenanigans behind the scenes. There's so much corruption among the elites. And you know, what, why why are they going after us for our $600 Venmo payment, but the Epstein list has never been released with all these wealthy billionaires that were going down. <laughs> there's, just, it, there's so many examples you can give. And I just think you have to ask, and I, I love what you said about fear because I remember when this was before I was even thinking about, I didn't even know about the links between vaccines and autism. I didn't know that we used to have 10, now we have 70. I wasn't really, you know, I was so overwhelmed as a new dad, but I remember Jen wasn't feeling good and I took Victor to get his vaccines. And I remember just, I was curious, I'm a curious person. So I remember asking the lady, and this was when, you know, I had to have a mask, she had a mask, everything was, yeah. was kind of still in the middle of COVID. She was so aggressive with me. She was, she was condescending, she talked down to me. And she was just like, there's no question he's on the Northwestern program. And I'm aware Northwestern is one of the best medical you know, hospitals in the world. So I, it was very much like, don't question it. Today he's getting four vaccines. He's getting two in one in each leg, one in each arm. And I was like, okay. And I just remember talking about that gut feeling. The way she did it was so rough and he was so miserable. And of course he's a crying baby getting stuck with needles. So he's going to be miserable. But I just had that feeling like this is not right. And I'll never forget that feeling. I felt guilty as a parent that like, I didn't know more about it and I wasn't more protective over my son. And cause I just knew like this woman was not a, you know, like most doctors, I think they go into the profession with good intentions. They care, they want to help people. This woman had all the opposite traits. Um, and, and like you said, she couldn't answer any questions and, and like some of the, so chicken pox talking about the different vaccines. There was one, um, the one story I heard was this one company, I, I don't remember which one, developed this vaccine specifically for an STD from people having a lot of sex, whether it was um, homosexual males or, or prostitutes or whatever it was. It was like this, this niche drug they developed. 
And then there was no market among these people because they didn't really care about the vaccine, this vaccine. So they're like, well, what are we going to do with it? So then they lobby to get it snuck into the vaccine battery with kids. And so you're giving these little babies or tiny toddlers STD vaccinations, even though they're not going to have sex for many, many years. And that's the that's perfect the example. Or, that's sorry, the not the HPV. That's, no, sorry, that's the um, Hep B. That's the one that they Hep get B, as, yes. as infants. The, like the infants, first thing exactly. that they get out of the womb, they're like, here's, yes. your, here's your Hep B. And, and, and that... It's just great that story you said about about where you know uh, the the little little person is is hitting all their markers and then suddenly they just have that glossy look in their eyes. I think of all the the things that I fear in life, aside from being completely mangled and still alive and like something just awful like that, I think that would have to be my biggest fear as a parent not doing the due diligence and then that happening to my healthy son or healthy daughter. It's just, it's so terrifying. And you hear these stories about these mums that are like RFK talked about it, RFK Jr. where he was talking about these mums that just, it, their lives are ruined. And and there's, there's just not, I mean, do you think these pharmaceutical companies making billions of dollars care? So that's why I'm just so glad that there's more and more evidence coming out um, about this stuff. But it's just, um, yeah. th- what with, with Dr. It's, Tesh. It's, it's so much information, but it's so, it's so hard to, to get through. Yes, and it's so to hard to know exactly. still what to do as a, as a parent, because how do you go to school? How do the kids go to school? How do they participate mm-hmm. in sports? Like they're asking for the yes. vaccine records for all these things. So there's ways of getting around it, but mm-hmm. it's not, it is not easy. It's it not is not exactly. easy. So and then, you really have to want it. And but, but the, what this Dr. Tess says, so she lives in England and she was talking about England, America, like the, the, the kind of the Western Europe and America. She said, a lot of these really bad diseases that were killing all these people, they're, they've been, they're not really around in the West anymore. So she said she was, it was they call it, I think she called it a wait and see approach where she said, listen, like they, they don't need a lot of these things now, but yes, if you're going on a family vacation to Africa and your son is six years old, he's going to have to get the vaccine for whatever they have in Africa. If you go into mm-hmm. Brazil, you go into Amazon. So like that idea of, cause that, that was what, I don't know what it is now, but I remember growing up in England, um, we had, probably less, I had less than 10 vaccines. You have very few in England. And it was, that was what they did in England was every time my dad was a pilot. So when I would take these family vacations, it was always like, okay, where are we going? What vaccines do we need to get for this reason? And I think that's just so much of a smarter approach is, is getting the ones you need and knowing what you're getting, as opposed to just saying, yeah, give my son anything on the 72 and, and right. hope for the best. Right. Well, that's it. I think what are we trying? I mean, what I think is trying to be sold to us from, and again, how I'm thinking about this maybe isn't correct. And I I, I in, encourage engagement on this conversation because I want information. I want you to tell me I'm wrong and why. But like, it seems to me that we're now not supposed to get sick. Kid, children, children aren't supposed to get sick anymore. So let's just give them all the vaccines for all of the, the things and then they're never going to be sick. But mm. the only way you build up an immune system is if you get sick every once in a while. Exactly. And they're going to get sick anyways, right? This is just the way life is. They're, they're toddlers and they're crawling on the ground. And the only thing they use is their mouth and they put everything in their mouth. Things you don't even want to think about, they put in their mouth. But that's mm-hmm. how they start to build up resistance yes. to other things. Look at what happened through COVID with the lockdowns. Look at how much worse RSV was for two and three-year-olds now than it was before that. And that was because they never engaged. They they would have gotten RSV earlier and it wouldn't have been as mm-hmm. bad or whatever. They would have built up some immunity to their brother or sister coming in with it. It's it's the, We've created a situation where it's untenable to continue life at this rate because they are going to turn around and say, okay, here's another million um, vaccines like they just came out with, mm. and I believe they just, it was, a, I believe it was mRNA. Maybe I'm wrong, but they just came out with an RSV vaccine that they said that up, uh, as little, as small as six months old should be given this. Mm. Okay. You just came out with it again. How long have you been researching it? Yeah. I don't think that long. Like, don't tell me that my six month old, I, I don't know. It just, it, but most people don't have the time to look into this. And again, most people think that their doctors know everything in Doctors know so much. They have to, to to do their jobs, and they most of them do very very well. But there's so many facets to human life, <laughs> and without the correct approach on it, or without having you know ten different people that are your experts that can tell you all of these things, how in the world are you supposed to add that on top of your forty hour a week job, your kids that you come home to that you want to mm-hmm. keep alive, <laughs> just mm-hmm. alive when they're crazy and nutty and need to get fed and everything else? It, it's just it's an it's, I know that it's our responsibility as parents to be as informed as possible about all of the things, but at some, at the end of the day, there's going to be things that are just impossible. And mm. so we trust the people that 
in our lives that are supposed to help us. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. the most of the doctors are out there telling us medications are the way to go. Yeah. Um, and not talking enough about, I mean, look, you still go to doctor's offices and they hand out suckers. Like I'm the, when the kid's done. Okay, here's your vaccine and here's your sucker. That was the best part. When all these parents took their kids to get their COVID shots, they took pictures like with the, you know, the bandaid on the arm eating McDonald's. And I'm like, okay, yeah. this is it. This is how we're yeah. doing it. Perfect. It's just, and I can't change the way people do things. And I I don't want to change the way they, I just want to inform people. Like maybe that's not the best way about this. Maybe we just generally take care of ourselves. And I'm not saying hundred percent of the time because that's too hard. Be be thoughtful about life and have some fun. Have ice cream every once in a while, but like it doesn't have to happen every single night. You don't have to have mm-hmm. McDonald's every day of the week. Just make some positive changes. So I don't, I'm, I can go off on this. Well, no, I can no, get I on think, a soapbox about this forever. <laughs> I, but I think that's so important. Um, the idea of like, I use uh, something that I know neck injuries in jujitsu is a big thing. And I've, I've had some issues. I've had many issues with my neck and I've had MRIs. I've got badging this. And I know a lot of people that I've trained with have had sur- surgery to their neck as, as opposed to um, getting the, call it an iron neck, this machine, strengthening it yes. up getting massage, getting, um, I've been getting scraping on my neck, which has really helped yeah. like all these different things where they're just, they have them about, and, and you know, if you're a surgeon, you're going to recommend surgery. If you're a general doctor, you're going to, you're not going to normally go to the root cause. You're always just going to get pain pills. And, and, and we're, we're a fundamentally sick society. And that's why I love that documentary painkiller. Cause I'd always hear about oxy as, as this terrible thing that ruined lives, but I didn't really know much about it. And that documentary, like it's, a, it was so, it was so well done, and it was just, it's entertaining. So I'd recommend everyone watch it. But it was just such a good glimpse into the way, into like the machinery and and the way it works. Like the the, the thing is, there's so much money behind it. It's almost like this beast of momentum that keeps going. And I feel like so. So there's um, something I just read. The World Health Organization and its private stakeholders have financially and ideologically committed to providing 500 vaccines by 2030. It's like what? It's just, it's it's so 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 crazy, um, and it says, yeah. Oh, that's the doctor Tess was saying. You know, for the sake of our children and a healthy society, we've got to question this blind faith in vaccines and the corporations that produce them and the regulatory bodies because th- there's so much evidence of just the shenanigans where you have people from the pharmaceutical companies, then they go and they retire, they get a position in the FDA. That this, this revolving yep. door back and forth. So it's like there's just no there's no oversight, and th- there's just it, 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 so so we have to question for the sake of our kids. So I, I just think that the there's certain things like I know as I get older, I feel like longevity science is going to be a real big passion of mine because I'm going to try and optimize myself for when I'm older. And right now at this point in my life with a young family, it's just there's nothing more important than this. So I'm, I'm just I'm so grateful you, you shared some of your some of your wisdom and just the idea of asking a lot of questions, listening to your gut, trying to trying to find out more about what the vaccines they're trying to push. And even the idea, like you said, of, of spacing them out, because th- when I tried to, I don't think I asked that, but I just was asking about um, the program that Northwestern has. And there was just, it was almost like there was, I, I don't know if, if they made it sound like it was either you're in the program and you don't ask questions and you have to stick to it yeah. or you're out. That's it. There's no and that's risk. and that truthfully is the way uh, some practices run that that you either stick to the CDC schedule or we, we don't want you in our in our care because they're cons- they're worried they think that that they will truly believe that those that are unvaccinated are going to cause all of the problems mm-hmm. which I mean it just show me the evidence for it I know I know I just I would like to know that because it's it's but that you you that's what I'm worried about with the current doctor that we go to. Again, she's been good up until this point, but I have a feeling that she's going to, I think I, we just got, I got a text message the other day saying that Archer was up for his shots and I'm like, well, okay. So I have a feeling we might get kicked out. And, right. and again, we're just spreading. We're just, I'm like when, until he's three, we're not traveling to Africa. We're not going all exactly. around South America. And so I don't think about these things. Right the time for asking questions and to be thoughtful. And again, to trust that gut, like you watching your kiddo get four shots at one time was it's devastating because it's, it's upsetting. And honestly, at that point, likely more for you than for them because they get over it really quickly, but that doesn't mean it's okay. Mm. <laughs> you know. 
Well, well, Kerry, listen, I know you're a busy mum of three. You've got things to do. So I just want to say it's such a pleasure. I always appreciate our conversations. I always learn from you. And it's just, it's really nice. Just like I have buddies that be like, hey, you want to run a half marathon tomorrow? I've got to pe people like you that I can ask because I don't have many people that that I know personally that I can ask for the advice and stuff. And I'm, I'm so grateful to you because I know over the years, I've always been picking your brains. And this has been really good for me. I'm going to just keep doing research, try and figure out, ask questions and, and just not have blind allegiance to these. Let's these, keep uh, communicating on it. Let's figure this out together. One step yeah. at a time. Yeah. <laughs> I and appreciate Kelly, one, Like Kelly, one thing is also just the, the I, I know that I had that image in my, that the voice in my head, whenever I hear, would hear someone talk about like vaccines being bad, I'm just like, okay, anti-vax nutcase. And I really changed my mind on that. But it's like the, um, society is just there's certain things where they just they force it down like no no this this is the way this is the way and it does go in there and i always thought i was an open-minded person but i realized with this stuff i was very close-minded and it took a lot of evidence coming out and it took really the covid vaccine to start asking questions so that has been a, a blessing as i'm trying to be more of minded about the stuff because you got to be in life and it's even if you think you're open-minded as you get older Probably not as naturally exactly become yeah. so I, I really appreciate your wisdom as always and i love you kelly yeah. hopefully i'll see you soon I love that very much. Thanks so much, Lawrence. <laughs> Have a great day.